Hi, my name is Dave Blanchard. I'm the CEO of the Hog Mandino Group, and I'm here with Matt McBurney. And I'm excited about this interview, Matt. Matt is the, As am vice, I. Is the vice president with the Riverside um, Health Center uh, in Chicago, just outside of Chicago. Yeah. And you've been coaching with Joe Rangel, one of my mm -hmm. favorite people on the planet. For good reason, yes. For good reason. Would you spend just a moment and, and set this up for us? Had you ever hired a coach before, a personal coach, executive coach? You, you know, I had not uh, personally hired one. I had had access to one, and I've worked with one over the last few years mm -hmm. uh, through another organization, but through my business, mm -hmm. uh, through my organization. And so it's been something that they've, uh, they've provided for me. Um, I've had some, both some one-on-one -on -one coaching and in the context of a group. Mm -hmm. And so I certainly found the benefit of it. And so, um, you know, when, when I was going through a bit of a rough patch, it was certainly something I knew that could be beneficial. Uh, but I knew it was important for me to find kind of my own way at this time and not rest on the organization to do it for me. Now, this could be too personal, but you said rough patch. Yeah. Uh, how comfortable would you be being vulnerable for the benefit of other executives? Because, you know, it's interesting when we work with executives, it's like the loneliest mm -hmm. place on the planet. Yes. You can't really go upstairs because you don't want anybody to see a weakness. You can't go downstairs because everybody wants your job. Right. <laughs> I, I don't know if that has anything to do with the rough patch, but just if you would yeah. just as comfortable as you might be, just share a little bit of yeah, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd come through a season uh, where I had grown not only in the organization, in fact, I'd moved, I'd been promoted to the vice president role uh, ha after having been in the organization for seven years. And a lot of that movement and promotion had been based on some of the coaching I'd had previously. And so I was applying a number of things, but then I kind of hit that plateau. Hmm. And so not only was I was in that plateau, but now I was beginning to deal with some new things different than I had ever dealt with before. Um, and I, I couldn't, I, even applying the things that I had learned throughout my entire career and specifically with some other uh, really strong coaching, I still was not being able to break through uh, some of the issues I was dealing with and I was becoming very internal. Hmm. And so my wife certainly knew it. Uh, because I was very open and honest with her. Um, I had actually visited my parents who live in town. I just asked for them to pray for me. And I just said, I, I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, seeking for what I need to do to grow uh, as a leader. And, you know, the thoughts begin to enter in of, well, am I just wrong for the situation and the organization and things like that? And do I just need to exit stage right? Um, hmm. And, a common friend of, of mine and, and uh, Joe Wrangle, my coach, uh, said, you know what, Matt, whether or not you stay with the organization is a decision to be made. Um, but if you don't deal with the things you're dealing with and discover them, you're going to take that with you wherever you go. And so for me, it was really a thing of, okay, I need to not run from this or try to. I need to confront it head on. And that kind of made me sick to my stomach. You know, I was nervous <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, just to think about, because I, I couldn't even diagnose what it was. Um, I've mm. been somebody that others have turned to at times for coaching, not on a formal basis, uh, but I've often mentored and, you know, had interns and young people that I've, I've helped grow uh, in a variety of leadership roles. And here I couldn't, I couldn't coach myself through it. And so I, I really needed to start and, and turn a new page with things. So Joe comes on the scene. How early on did you yeah. get introduced to the assessment tool that's been created? You know, actually before I even met Joe. And so it was our common friend who had, uh, her name is Amy. Amy was familiar with the assessment and uh, was beginning to move into training to be a coach herself. And just as a dear friend of ours introduced me to the tool. And then when I saw the results, I, I was so amazed <laughs> at the insight that it gave me and actually insight on things that I had never tested before as being risk areas. Mm -hmm. And it was a real surprise to me uh, and a real surprise even to my wife and some others around me. But the more I digested it, I thought, yeah, this is the root issue. Um, uh, and, and again, there are a number of things, you know, that are opportunities for growth, but sure. 
Um, I, I have, have a history of being uh, a pretty good uh, public presenter. Uh, I have a history in theater, uh, on, you know, both on stage and also directing others on stage. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I, I'm an extrovert by nature. And what I found was that actually there were some issues that I probably was covering with public applause, if you will, uh, but was not dealing with on the, on the in, internal side. And so the applause, if you will, could cover my maybe, you know, feelings of, of inadequacy or uh, self-esteem. And it would cover it just long enough to sustain me maybe through a difficult time. But what I was finding is I didn't have that external applause and I didn't want to use that as a band-aid this time. I wanted to begin to deal with what is it internally that uh, is a gap and, and maybe a, an area I need to address, uh, you know, to be really a whole person on the inside before I would turn back to ever potentially be on stage and get applause in that regard again. I'm feeling this emotional response to what you just said. Yeah. Because so often when we're dealing with a professional, it's the title, it's the position, or the public applause to help them get through the dark moment. Yeah, right. They, they don't stop long enough to say, I, I want to go inside. I want to get deep into the real issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're working on creating this assessment. I'm a bottom line guy. We want to get to the real stuff. What's really, really holding us back. I, I share this with you. You may not be aware of this, but just a few weeks ago, we were in a meeting mm -hmm. and we were talking about the assessment and we had called it the six advisors assessment. Then we had called it the intentional creation assessment, trying to find that name that spoke to the issue. And somebody yeah. says, well, what does it do? I said, well, it measures our habits of thinking. Mm. And Paul, our president said, well, why don't we just call it habit finder? Yeah. 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 And he jumped on GoDaddy and found out the URL was available. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yes. Habit Finder was available. And so we've shifted the name to be more appropriate. Yeah. Instead of someone said, well, what does that mean? Well, it means we do habit finding. Well, let's mm -hmm. just call it Habit Finder. So now we yeah. get to the real issues. And right. Joe comes on the scene as a coach. Share with me not just the discovery of these things. What started to happen is you started to do the work with what you discovered. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it, it really was the right work for me to do because, um, you know, the other thing probably associated with me is that I, I've historically been a bit of a people pleaser mm -hmm. and have responded nicely to the outside voices and opinions and influences. But again, that can mask having to deal with what's going on, you know, internally and what's that voice inside and, and it talking about. So I met Joe and... Um, you know, right away, he did a number of things just to help move the conversation to a place of honesty and transparency. Um, I didn't feel, and again, it tends to be my nature a little bit too, but I decided if I'm going into this coaching role, um, I'm going to fully embrace it. And so it doesn't do me any good in this process uh, to hold things back or to hide things. I'm just going to be transparent. Um, and where I think Joe did really well was helping to set that stage. He himself was transparent. Mm -hmm. um, he would early on ask me, and then later I've learned that this is a, an important technique for me to introduce, but he would say, is it okay for me to share? And so we did that in, in our first conversations pretty early, but, you know, it began to set that thing of, look, we're, we're not going to try to create a veneer that we have it together. Our deal is to, to look to improve. And uh, so anyways, I think he set that stage really well. And one of the things that, that helped me too is our common friend, Amy, uh, had worked with Joe previously and she had a lot of great things to say about him. He had been helpful for her. And so that, that personal um, level of support and, and uh, endorsement, uh, I, you know, certainly carried a lot of value with me as well. And uh, so anyways, I think we moved in really quickly and, uh, you know, Joe has a really good sense of even on the phone being able to capture my emotion or maybe know when to press something or that I might be not wanting to go someplace, but it's an important question to ask. He has a really good sense about how to do that. He's not timid. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. But he's so and, he's and, so gentle. We we teach the yeah. coaches. And, and Joe was a natural from the very beginning. Yeah, very compassionate, very empathetic. Mm -hmm. But he knows when to put the feet under someone's fire or fire yeah. under someone's fire under the feet. feet. Yeah, we'll get that right. Right. Yeah. Well, okay, we're in business. Right. This business guy is watching this, right? Or this businesswoman, and she's going, okay, but what's the ROI? What's the return on yeah. the investment? Take us to the return on the investment. Well, you know, I, I would say first and foremost, um, when I was in, in a difficult place, when I was struggling, um, you know, for me, it was things like I didn't sleep well. Um, I actually began to do probably a lot of the things that were counterintuitive or counteractive to me getting better. So I was withdrawing from people. I was not investing in the relationships that matter to me. Um, I was becoming more and more timid, less afraid to make the decisions that people rely on me to make because I was afraid of potential criticism. And so I, I went from there and it wasn't overnight, but it was something that over the, the few months and what I'm still working on is being very proactive and uh, decisive and willing to be confident uh, in my decision and, and move forward on those things, which makes everything roll better. The other thing for me is a, a lot of my world uh, and, and the work that I do relies on creativity. Mm -hmm. Well, if, you, if, if somebody tries to approach being creative from a place of concern about the criticism, mm -hmm. creativity goes way down. And if you try to be creative and you're working on a dry well, you start doing damage real quickly. You can crank it for a while, but then you just end up just feeling raw. And so for me, it was turning all of that around so that I could go back in and laugh and have levity and creativity. Um, you know, and, and guess what? My relationships, uh, you know, both friends and family, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of went back to that, that place of normal. And I felt like I, I became myself again. I was able to rediscover myself and, uh, and be more confident and comfortable in who I am. The words that keep coming, the words that keep coming, unleashing my natural genius. Yeah. That yeah. self-sabotaging internal dialogue is so destructive. Absolutely. We, yeah. we call it enemy number one. Mm -hmm. Enemy number mm -hmm. one. We use a phrase in the office, uh, the fiduciary of the foundational. That's my title. Yeah. In working with this material, you know, some organizations say, well, what skills does it teach me? Well, you, you obviously learn intrinsic validation, how to connect more effectively with people. But it really is deeper than skills-based kind of training. Would you agree? Right. You're yeah. Really the foundation that frees up the genius, that frees up the natural empathy, the intuition, the ability, shuts off some of that noise to free you up. Right. I don't want to put those words in your mouth, but that was our mission to begin with. Yeah, and, and, I th and I think it's an important distinction. There are a lot of things that leaders can turn to to do skill development mm -hmm. uh, on a lot of different scales. You know, I, I've completed a master's degree like a lot of people in business have. Others have just a great entrepreneurial sense about them. Their skills, hey, that's a great thing to have. But, but this is about really investing in the leader and where the leader is, is working from. And all the skills in the world won't make up the gap if the leader is not whole. Thank you. You alluded to something. I want you to just go into a little bit more depth. Yeah. When a leader is in the workplace and mm -hmm. is struggling, you know, they can't go up, can't go down. It's pretty lonely. They generally end up taking that home with them. Yeah. And what a burden to place on a spouse. Yeah. Yeah. If Marcia were here with us, what would she say happened as a result of this experience? You know, well, she, I, I, I married well beyond myself. I'll tell you that. I married I'll, I'll a, a your remarkable coverage. lady. <laughs> <laughs> I'll kick my coverage. That's right. I, I married a, a truly remarkable person. And what I love is that, that her patience, you know, whether it's been through this time or, or any other, 
she never became impatient with me, but mm. she was the first one, the first cheerleader. You know, when I began to say, look, I want to make a commitment to work with a coach, which is a time commitment. It's a financial commitment. Yeah. It's a thought commitment. It's a habit change commitment. Yeah. She was the first one that said, I want you to do that. This is an important investment uh, that, that she was totally on board with me making. And that is, is really important. But she, so she has seen, you know, the, the change at home. Um, and, and she was struggling through it with me. She was trying to help, mm -hmm. you know, kind of coach me along and be that good voice. But again, if the internal voice is not saying the right things and I'm listening to it, even her strong, dependable outside voice couldn't make up for that. And so I, I was, that, that was working against itself. And now, um, you know, if my internal voice is aligned, um, then it's really multiplying and we're, you know, again, we can always grow in our relationship, but it puts us on a really solid ground, uh, you know, both in our relationship and we have four thriving children and I want to be fully present and fully available to them when I'm with them. And uh, this puts me in a far better place where work is joyful. I look forward to it. Monday mornings are fun. Today's Monday. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm excited about today. Um, where before, you know, the, 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 and, and I think there was even a term in some of the material that I read that just talked about the dread that might happen on a Sunday afternoon when you realize you got to go back into that work week. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's now flipped around. I look forward to Mondays. And those who stay up late into the night because if they go to sleep, the next day comes. Yes. Right. Put it off. So you delay. Far, delay as far as you can. Yeah. Well, I have a, a special to favor, a fresh special favor to ask of you. Sure. One of the great challenges we faced as a company is bringing this material into corporate America and having an appreciation for not only its importance, but the way that it in fact can impact return on investment. Right. We're kind of in that systemic right, wrong, win, lose, life, death, quota, rules, regulations, kind of corporate environment. And yeah. when we find a corporate leader who gets it, Mm -hmm. Oh, Matt, it just, it just rings with my heart. I just love it. Yeah. Yeah. Would you spend just a moment talking to corporate leaders mm -hmm. about this topic in relationship to their organization? Whatever Absolutely. comes to your heart. This yeah. is a heart. This is a heart thing. Those of us that work in leadership structures know that there is a, uh, a stewardship responsibility, whether we're in the for-profit or the non-for-profit sector. Uh, we are, and rightly so, focused on performance, investment, return on investment, bottom line, proactivity, doing the right thing and doing it the right way for the sustainable long haul. There are a lot of great... Uh, there are a lot of great skills that are used. There's a lot of great uh, commitment to hard work uh, and being aligned. And I'm supportive of all those things. But what I have seen um, the very best leaders do is balance out the, uh, the right brain and the left brain. Uh, be aware that people are made for uh, more than just productivity, but they are made to be whole, to be growing, to be in right relationship, not only on their team that they work with uh, or teams that they work with, but where they are in their personal life. And if things are aligned at work, then they can be aligned at home. And if things aren't aligned in one of those places, it shows up in the other and it begins to erode. And we begin to burn through people unknowingly um, if we're not investing in those people. So I, I've been in a, a really fortunate place in that throughout much of my career, uh, the leaders that I have worked on teams with and for um, have, have resourced, given me uh, grace, uh, have given me margin so that I could be the very best person I could be. Um, this process that, I've, that I am still going through um, because it really is valuable to me, helps me produce on all those things that are measurable even though this one might feel a little bit on the soft side initially, but I found it to be the most valuable and far more valuable than a skill set that I could have picked up uh, additionally at this point. 
you know, this for me has really planted my feet firmly and will help me grow for the long haul. And that is uh, truly invaluable. I'm, I'm grateful, you know, personally to have made the investment. Matt, thank you. We've, we summarize it this way. The soft skills have become hard facts. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Congratulations I agree. that you're working with an organization that embraces this approach. That is. Yeah, very much. Can you imagine if the nation, corporate America, <laughs> embraced yeah. this as an important piece? How much productivity, creativity, ownership, excitement could be brought into an organization. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and even as we think about uh, retention of talent Mm -hmm. and as we think about the millennials who are taking over the workforce in a good way, but you know, I would say right, wrong or indifferent, uh, guess what? They outnumber the boomers and they're coming. They are looking for more than anything else in quote unquote compensation. They're looking for opportunity and and growth, personal growth. And so for organizations and businesses to be very intentional about investing in their workforce, uh, that is going to pay not only in retention of talent, but in the maximization of all of those talented people on their workforce. Well, Matt, couldn't have said it better. I appreciate the opportunity to dialogue. Oh, this has been wonderful. Um, Only last thing. Sometimes when I turn off record, someone says, what I really wanted to say was. (laughs) (laughs) I hear you. Yeah. The cup may be empty. It may be. And that's great because you've shared some very powerful things with us. Just, just be with it for a moment as if we just turned off record and you and I were just chatting and there's just something else that comes. It might be something you might want to say to Joe, he's going to watch this. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as coaches, we live for our clients' success. Yeah. And that's what we yeah. live for. So anything that you'd like to say to Joe or just to, just in general about your experiences, anything else that might still be there? You know, one of the things that a process like this affords is one-on-one. Mm-hmm. It's so much of our, our coaching life, you know, how, you know, whether we're coming through an education, a formal education or otherwise – is done as one part of a group. Then you kind of find your way and apply it to yourself. You know, be able to be in in regular communication with somebody who uh, who has who isn't looking to take your job, <laughs> or or isn't looking to see you know if you're a risk to the organization, but is just solely invested in you being at your best. No other, uh, no other motivation whatsoever to have that one-on-one direct coaching is really a unique scenario in life. We don't find many places where that's the case, no, we don't. Uh, but it's incredibly valuable. It offers uh, remarkable insight and therefore the journey is personalized. No two journeys are the same. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. For those who have been watching this discussion, and Matt, just so grateful that you take the time out of your schedule to share these things. We just encourage you to go take your Habit Finder, habitfinder.com. It's really simple. Yes. Uh, But when you get your results, there's a link you can click on where you can spend time with a Habit Finder specialist to Mm -hmm. have a little better understanding. And if you'd like to go beyond that, They'll be happy to refer you into our coaching community. We have some wonderful coaches. Joe Rango being one of our, by the way, one of our absolute top coaches. Yes. A human being. So grateful for Joe's participation and embracing these principles and and living them in his own life. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you also said there's transparency. Yeah. Sometimes the coach is only two blocks ahead, but they know the glue buckets and the potholes in the next two blocks. Right. We're all on the journey. We're all on Mm -hmm. this journey. Matt, thank you. Wish you the best. And to Marsha and your family, your four children, thank, thank you. you. And, and God bless and great success. You as well, Dave. Thank you so much. You're so welcome.